Wow, that thing works when you turn it on. <sighs> Session two, right? First one was on uh, healing. Thank you. The second one was on, second one is on deliverance. Ah, okay. Miracles of deliverance. Again, what we're looking at is, is this something that is unique to Jesus or something that is weird in his generation that people would just be completely freaked out at and run for the hills? Or is Jesus again entering into time and space as God in the flesh and, and, and interacting with people, meeting them right where they're at? Not just linguistically, you know, language use and vocabulary, but in terms of culture, in terms of religious practices and stuff like that. Is he that perfect puzzle piece that fits right in that completes the puzzle? So, uh, let's go. We talked about healing, specifically the laying on of hands and touch and that sort of thing. And we're talking about miracles that Jesus performs. And we're asking, do those fit in well, comport with what we see in the Hebrew Bible, uh, between the Testaments and in the time of Jesus? And is there some sort of an indication then when we look at those different layers Hebrew Bible, intertestamental or between the testaments period, New Testament period, and onward uh, 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 even as far as, as we are. And we're looking at, is there a consistency within the nature or character of God that is displayed this way, this, this continuity of belief, practice, etc. So I want to remind you of the purpose of miracle. It's to meet the needs of people. It's to reveal the character of God, and it's to miracle, including deliverance, to extend God's kingdom rule, to include more people, to include more aspects of human life, etc. So in this session, we're dealing with miracles of deliverance, or you could call it exorcism. In the Gospel of Matthew, we hear the story about the demon being cast out and then people responding to that ministry of Jesus, nothing like this was ever seen in Israel. So if you're getting that kind of language up front, then can we say, well, yes, there's consistency, there's connectedness, there's continuity, and Jesus is fitting right in. We have to ask this question because people are kind of, wow, that's, that's interesting. That's different. That really got my attention. If it's same old, same old. So watch carefully because this one is going to be even more, can I use the word nuanced? Okay, even more you know, multi-layered or multi-textured than the, than, the previous, um, than the previous discussion. In Luke chapter 4, there was a man in the synagogue possessed. And, they, and the demon said... Uh, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to, to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him and said, be quiet, come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down in the midst, then he came out without doing him any harm. Amazement, this is like surprise. Amazement came upon them all and they began discussing with one another, what is this word or message because with authority and power, he casts out the unclean spirits. They're looking at his, how does he accomplish this? By his authority and by his power. So there's some similarity. Yes, demons are being cast out. People, there are demons. People are infected by demons and people have demons removed. I hope that you're going to see in this presentation, those are, that's standard stuff. The how is what's going to be unusual and attract people's attention. What is this word or this thing or this matter? It's with authority and power that he casts out the unclean spirit. So Luke chapter 9, another passage, a man from the multitude saying, says, please deal with my son. 
A spirit seizes him, suddenly screams, throws him in, into convulsions and foaming at the mouth. As By the way, you notice how Luke is so specific about physical phenomena? Okay, you got it. Dr. Luke, author of book, the, the books of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Foaming at the mouth, mauls him and scarcely leaves him. I begged your disciples to cast it out and they could not. Jesus says, oh, unbelieving and perverted generation, how long am I going to be with you? While he was still approaching, the de- Jesus is walking up to the guy and the demon begins to dash him to the ground, threw him into, into a convulsion, you know, more descriptions of physicality. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, gave the boy back to his father. They were all amazed at the greatness of God. While everything was, everyone was marveling, that, that word is amazement. Um, the word is uh, in, in Greek, in ecstasis. Ecstasis? What does that sound like in English? Ecstatic or Ecstasy? right? Not the drug, but the the state of being. Um, And so, yeah, we sometimes borrow words from older languages, and then that word starts to morph. So it doesn't have anything to do with the drug, and it also doesn't have to do with some sort of an out-of-body, you know, um, experience. This in ecstasis, it simply means they're amazed. They're standing amazed at the um, power of God. In the Gospel of Mark, this is the longest of the passages uh, of, of any of Jesus' exorcistic activity. They came to the other side of the sea, so now they're on the, the Greek or the non-Jewish side, on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, and into the country of the Gerasenes. We know exactly where Gerasa is. Sometimes the bus stops there. There's a wide spot in the road. You can get the bus all completely off of the road. And the hillside goes directly down. It's the only place on the, in the entire Sea of Galilee, 13 miles long by 7 miles wide. The whole Sea of Galilee, there's only one place where the hillside runs directly into the, um, uh, into the sea. And interestingly, a, um, a, an outcropping of flint rock is there. And that's also unusual. And it's the flint rock that's used to gash, even to make weapons in the ancient world. Uh, people that are napping their own broadheads to do traditional archery, they're doing it out of flint rock. Okay, so the two things come together, the, 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 the text, the, the geography or the topography, the lay of the land, and also the geology of the land comes into perfect focus and we ride right by there or stop there when we're on our trips. Anyway, he had come out of the, uh, Jesus had come out of the boat, the man came out of the tombs with an unclean spirit dwelling among the tombs. No one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain because of the, the, the incredible physical power that was being generated by this demon possession. He'd often been bound with shackles, chains, and broke them in pieces, constantly day and night among the tombs. In Judaism, this would render you ritually impure constantly because it's contact with the dead crying out, gnashing himself with stones, that outcropping of flint rock that's there at Kursi Gergesa. And seeing uh, Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him, cried out with a loud voice, what do I have to have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, come out. In Hebrew, it's a very simple command, tseh, tseh. It means go out. And and I'll show you a text where another rabbi uses the same language, exactly the same Hebrew word, tseh, or go out, T-S-E-H, or something like that with an exclamation point at the end. He was, because he was saying, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, because we are many. He began to entreat him earnestly not to send them out of the whole country, you know, like into another region. But there was a a big herd of swine feeding there on the mountain. And the demon said, send us into the swine so that we can enter them. Maybe my pointer's in the way. 
he gave them permission. Coming out the unclean spirits entered the swine. Her, the herd rushed down into a, the, the steep bank and into the sea, the Sea of Galilee, uh, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen ran away, told everybody about it. They came back, and the demon-possessed guy is sitting at Jesus' feet. And the people in that land, maybe it's just freaked out because the change is so evident in this guy, or maybe it's because of the loss of money of the 2,000 uh, pigs. Don't know, I wasn't there. Not that old, I promise. But they became frightened, and they begged Jesus to leave. They didn't want that kind of stuff going on in their country. Some people don't want that kind of stuff going on in their church. Oops, never mind. That's another one of those. Just unhear that. <laughs> Jesus was asked by the guy, please let me go with you. And Jesus said, no, you go and tell the great things that the Lord has done for you, how he's had mercy on you. This is an expression of the nature of God as being a compassionate, merciful God, a God who is willing to and able to deliver, to deliver. He's been doing it for a long time, since Noah, right? And he delivered those eight people in the flood. Since those thousands of people were delivered from Egypt, God's been in the business of delivering folks. Yeah, but all of that stopped because John's heart stopped beating, right? Back to the discussion about cessationism. Or he penned the last word of the New Testament. Or the last few seconds of the first century ticked off the clock. You know, when the big ball came down and the balloons were released and time Central Square in Jerusalem or something like that. All of that is weird. That's all goofy stuff. And the Bible says nothing about it. When John's heart stops beating, when the last word gets written on the New Testament, when the last second ticks off of 11.59 p.m. Um, in A.D. 99, that's all goofy. And I know that it's goofy. You know how we know it's goofy? It's not in the book. It's not in the book. Somebody worked really hard to make that stuff up. So what do we do? If we are followers of the book, what do we do with those kinds of arguments? Paul talks about casting down every vain imagination and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So we cast that down. We simply say, nope, I'm not allowing that to be a part of my belief system, my theological structure. As Protestants, that's what we're supposed to be doing. The Bible is supposed to be our only rule for matters of faith and practice, what we believe and how we live our Christian lives, not tradition, not what your pastor when you were growing up taught you, not what your parents role modeled for you, not when it comes to hard work ethic and all that other stuff, yes, but when it comes to faith and practice, the final um, appeal is to the word of God. If it's in there, you are so good to go. If it's not, then you are on shaky ground. It's just the way this thing works. I didn't make up those rules either. By the way, if you accept anything, any other uh, system of authority, church tradition, uh, personal practice, somebody else's personal revelation or whatever, it's, you're eventually going to have a crisis of faith. Because those competing sources of authority in your life are eventually going to come into conflict with one another and you're going to have to choose between one or the others. So let's just make the, make the word, you be, let's just fully embrace this idea of Protestantism and part of that is it, it's sola scriptura. This was one of the three battle cries of the Protestant Reformation, sola scriptura. You, you can get that in Latin, right? Sola, it's like solely or only. And scriptura is sacred scripture. Yeah, only the word can determine ultimately what we believe and how we live out our faith in our world. So, uh, not sure exactly how we got on that, but it was fun anyway. Um, <laughs> Matthew chapter 12 uh, Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. I quoted that a little bit earlier. I think I got that right, didn't I? 
Okay, if I didn't, then unhear that part. Uh, Luke 12, if I cast out demons, this is Luke's version of it. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has, kingdom of God has come upon you. Really interesting because in the book of Exodus, uh, we're told it's by the finger of God that God is working these miraculous works in Egypt that end or conclude in the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. <laughs> we found Jesus' point of reference. Aren't we cool? Do you see what Jesus did there? He's channeling the book of Exodus. If I cast out demons by the finger of God and then Exodus 8, this is the finger of God. It's the only place. that These are the only two places that that phrase shows up in your whole Bible. That's even if you got the Catholic Bible that has extra books in between. It's the only place. Not in Ben Sir or Tobit or uh, First Maccabees, just not there. Let my people go. God, look, hey y'all, God is into freedom. He's into the people, people that he created in his image to be free moral agents. God is before there was ever a Thomas Paine or Thomas Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin or 4th of July, God's been into freedom. He wants people that he created to be free moral agents. He wants them to be free moral agents. He wants us to, when the sun sets you free, come on y'all free indeed God is into freedom both testaments and all through human history God is a God of freedom let my people go God I think he's still standing on the banister of heaven and he's still yelling that today leave my people alone let my people function as free moral agents you don't have to dictate everything in life to these guys okay you know don't like you know kill people and stuff there's some basics there right but every, you know, so much so much else is leave my people alone let them serve me Paul talks like this he says but if we live by the spirit then let us walk by the spirit right yeah that that freedom that God brings into our lives that no fourth of July celebration is ever going to give you although those are great it's a great reminder of the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air. In the Hebrew Bible, we're looking at deliverance, the issue of deliverance. In the Old Testament, we do get at least one example of demon possession and of demon removal. In 1 Samuel, we're told that an, an evil spirit came upon King Saul. And, and what would happen? They, they called David. And this is before he's, you know, King David and, you know, the great ruler of a, of a unified tri, uh, 12 tribes of Israel, etc. This is David the courtier, the courtier uh, David the young man who's brought to the palace and he plays his harp and the evil spirit would depart from him. That's the Hebrew Bible's recognition. There's a negative supernatural. Sometimes it gets personal and becomes involved in a human life. And third point, it can be removed. That demonic spirit or demonic presence can be removed. So this is not something that's brand new that just starts happening when Jesus shows up on the planet. All of a sudden, the devil starts acting out, pushing back. No, it's, it's really not that. In the, now we're into the intertestamental period between the testaments. In the intertestamental book of Tobit, this comes from the, the late third century BC. Now, some people may have uh, be closely associated with or have come out of Roman Catholicism. This is one of those 14 books that is included. It's not a quote Catholic book. It's just not. How do we know? There weren't any Catholics around in the third century BC, y'all. Jesus wouldn't come for another 300 years into the future. Then you started getting followers of Jesus who are called Christians, yeah? Followers of the way or uh, followers of Jesus or, or Christians. So there aren't any Catholics when this is written. This book was then canonized on April the 8th, 1546 A.D., by the Roman Catholic Church 
at an event called the Council of Trent, T-R-E-N-T, the Council of Trent, April the 8th, 1546. This is after the Protestant Reformation had already taken place, or at least the beginnings of it. Martin Luther, John Calvin, these guys are back in the late 1400s. So this is a half a century later. The Protestant church leaders had said, we have newly literate people. Folks have just learned how to, how to read. They're, they're not the products of, you know, extensive learning and some, you know, monastery. They haven't studied under monks. They're not all priests and stuff. They don't have this big picture background. So what we need to start doing is we need to separate out what is clearly the word of God. It's part of the Hebrew Bible. Judaism's always held to these 39 books. Keep printing these. For God's sake, keep printing these because they're great devotional material. For me, it's great archaeological material. Literary archaeology. Not literal archaeology, digging in dirt, but digging into words. So the the Protestant leaders, early Protestant Reformation, people like Luther and Calvin, they said, we want you, we we urge you, O Christian uh, reader, to diligently read these works because of their devotional value, because of their inspirational value. Um, For me, it's because of their cultural and language and reconstructing ancient history and that kind of thing. But the early Christian leaders of the Protestant Reformation were saying, read this. But they wanted them published in a separate volume so that newly saved, newly literate Protestants would not get confused what was and was what was not Bible. So how are we using this? In the same way I would show you a picture of some ancient artifact that was discovered in an archaeological excavation, in the same way that I would show you the foundations of buildings that were discovered at Magdala, where Mary was from, or at Tel El Araj, which we know now is biblical Bethsaida, um, where Peter and Andrew originally were from. Uh, and so we're, ju- we're simply using this material. We're not saying it's Bible. We're not trying to add to the Bible. We're trying to gain clarity by looking at all of the evidence, biblical and extra biblical, literary and archaeological. You see what we're doing here? Everybody okay with this? Nobody's going to pass out or anything. Okay, thank you. Let's just hold it together because... I promise nobody's going to die here when we're going to all end up being okay. I'm a doctor. (laughs) Take two and call me in the morning. This young man is going to be married and he's, he's had six brothers who married this woman and they all died. You ever heard this? Matthew 22. Ever heard this in your New Testament? Matthew 22 discussion between Jesus and the Sadducees. This is where they're getting that story. This is where they're getting their argument that they bring to Jesus. Okay, so uh, the angel, we're, we're, all we're doing is Paul, t- is Paul Harvey stuff here, the rest of the story. I know y'all are old, most of y'all are old enough to remember that, right? A blessed memory, moment of silence. Now, um, uh, the angel said to this young man, Uh, don't you remember the words your father commanded you um, to take a wife from among your own people? Now listen to me, brother. She will become your wife. Don't worry about the demon because the demon had something to do, according to Tobit, with the death of this guy's previous like six brothers that had married the same woman. I'm not sure if I'd ante up for this, but this is an interesting story and it's in the gospel. It's in Matthew 22. Okay. When you enter the bridal chamber, now watch modality here. Take live ashes of the incense and lay it upon the heart and liver of a fish so that the demon will smell it and run away and never return. There's a sort of a very ancient 2,300-year-old exorcism formula or ritual. Now, in another, further on, fast forwarding into chapter 8 of Tobit. When they finished eating, they escorted Tobias in to her. In Orthodox Jewish weddings, once the, uh, the festivities are over, the mother and father of both the bride and the groom escort them to the bridal chamber, and they, they pray a blessing over them, and they say, 
may we have a grandson nine months from tonight. <laughs> there is this biblical verse, Peru Uruvu. It's in kind of a play on words almost. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It's the only commandment humanity's ever kept, y'all. <laughs> to the tune of about seven plus billion people. Fascinating. Starts with two, now it's seven plus billion. That's Peru Uruvu. Be fruitful and multiply. So it says they did this and the demon smelled the odor and fled to the remotest parts of Egypt and an angel bound him there. That's what we get in the Bible is angels do binding all the way to the book of Revelation. Now we have a Dead Sea Scroll. So we're from 3rd century BC into like 2nd century BC. You know about Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Yes, Dead Sea Scrolls. Where were they found? Yeah. Who was buried in Grant's tomb? Okay, uh, in this particular text, it talks about David, the son of Jesse. This is biblical David. He composed songs. Now we get some, we hear all about that in the Bible. Now we're getting extra stuff. To be sung over the possessed, four of them. So David is involved. According to these people in the second century BC, David the king was involved, was engaged in, a, in ministry of exorcism. We hear in another dead, a diff, completely different Dead Sea text. In the name of, and then you get that four-letter Hebrew word, yod heh vav -Hey, or Y-H-V-H, or Y-H-W-H, that we then add vowels to, and it comes out Yahweh, or Yahweh. In the name of Yahweh, Solomon, this is David's son, Solomon, um, and it's probably also in the name of Solomon. So in these ritual formulas of exorcism, they're invoking the name of God and also invoking the name of King Solomon. I guess presumably in the previous text, David as well. And he will invoke the name of Yahweh or Yahweh to set him free from every affliction of the spirits of the devils. Here's another Dead Sea text. Anytime you see Q, that's Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were discovered. The 11 major caves, more than 900, parts of more than 900 manuscripts, all of them pre-Christian. All right, so great stuff for Jewish backgrounds leading up to the New Testament. This is prayer of Nabonidus. An exorcist forgave my sin. I had a conversation earlier about the relationship between healing and repentance and forgiveness. Fascinating subject. Don't have time to address it this time. He forgave my sin, and he was a Jew from among the exiles in Babylon. Fascinating. Jewish people involved in exorcism. In Josephus, I would ask you to describe him, but I'm going to do it quickly for purposes of uh, just expediting this morning. First century Jew, contemporary of the apostles, resident of the land of Israel, and writes in the same Greek that our New Testament was written in. Very important source. First century source. He's writing at the same time that the, our New Testament is being written. You know, if you had to kind of like tailor make some extra stuff that's going to help us to understand the world of our New Testament, you couldn't make a better source than Josephus. Now, am I saying, well, Josephus should be added to the New Testament, should be added to the canon? No, we're doing literary archaeology. We're digging into literature to get what? To get clarity, to get perspective, to get background so that, we, so that when we read the words of the New Testament, they pop at us. Literally, they, they jump out at us and we understand communication in context, the way that all communication works. It's the reason why we ask this one question more often than we do any other time when we're having a conversation with someone. What do you mean by that? What does that mean? Trying to get context, trying to get clarity. Josephus, in his history of the Jewish war, there is a root, the modality, a method, means by which there is a root that if it is brought to sick people it quickly drives the demons away 
that enter into men who are alive. And Josephus again, first century source. When the divine power departed from Saul, that's King Saul, some strange demonic, whatever orders, de demonic orders came upon, uh, or disorders came upon him, then uh, they brought upon him suffocations ready to choke him, for which other physicians could not find any other remedy than this. To observe when these demons came upon him, this is about King Saul, and then bring David in. David charmed his passion, was the only physician against the trouble that he had of these demons. You see, he's kind of taking that passage from 1 Samuel and sort of amplifying it just a little bit, spelling out details. Whenever that came upon him, he would recite hymns. Remember that passage in the Dead Sea Scrolls said David composed hymns that he would use in removing demonic spirits, reciting hymns and playing upon the harp that's really the point of departure they pick this playing on the harp and then they've kind of you know added to that it's in the tradition it's all the way back there in the scrolls now it's in the first century second bc now first century a.d and bringing saul back to his right mind here's another text from josephus god enabled solomon to er learn the skill to expel demons so much of this stuff tracks back some to David, but so much of it back to Solomon. He composed incantations by which these distempers are alleviated. He left behind him at the manner of using exorcisms by which they drive out demons. This is a first century source, y'all. This is like a Dead Sea Scroll telling us that I find it really interesting. We can talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's really difficult to talk about the wisdom of Solomon or the book of Tobit or some of this stuff in the Apocrypha. It's all intertestamental pre-Christian Jewish stuff. It gives us background to these Jewish writings, these uh, 27 writings that we call the New Testament. He composed these incantations to, and using exorcisms to drive demons away. There was this guy whose name was Eliezer. He gives a specific example, much like Luke does. He'll make a point, then he'll give an example to do the same thing. Luke and Josephus are writing at about the same time. It's fascinating. Eliezer was releasing people who were demoniacs. He's not just describing in general, yeah, this happens. He's giving specific examples of how this happens. One time, this guy Eliezer was doing this in the presence of Vespasian. Vespasian would become the next Roman emperor, guys. He's the one who invaded Israel to put down the first Jewish revolt that happened between 66 and 70 AD. And before his sons and his captains and the whole multitude, the whole Roman army is watching this stuff, watching this Jew perform these exorcisms. Now, the manner of cure was this. This should be uh, curious or interesting to you. Uh, because he's going to tell you exactly how Eliezer went about uh, expelling these demons. He put a ring that had a root uh, of one of the sorts mentioned by Solomon in these exorcistic rituals that supposedly Solomon had composed. He put it up to the nose of the demoniac and he would draw the demon out of his nostrils. Sounds a whole lot like some of the charismatic stuff that I've read. Honest to goodness, where you have to do, you say these certain words and your body has to be in a certain posture and the, and the body of the, of, of the possessed has to be in a certain posture and you have to do this and that and say this first. And it sounds a lot like some of the stuff that has been cooked up in the 21st century. He drew the demon out through his nostrils and then the man fell down immediately. Did we see that in Jesus' ministry? where the, the, the guy would fall, the, per, the possessed person would fall down? Yes, we did see that. He fell down immediately and he commanded the demon to return no more. Still making mention of Solomon, you know, to expel these demons because these demons are still scared of King Solomon. Don't you know? I threw that in for people from Minnesota. And in, in reciting incantations that he, Solomon, had composed. 
Now, Eliezer would con- convince these people, Vespasian and his sons and his captains and his army, he, he would convince them and demonstrate to the spectators that he had such power and the demon had actually gone out of the person, this is not just all make-believe, by setting a little way off a cup or a basin full of water. And then he would command the demon, as the demon went out of the man, to upset the 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 vessel of water and thereby the spectators would know that the demon had left the man just ringing any bells y'all Matthew Mark 5 okay so if if that's what's happening then Jesus is not just anti-pig you know or, or anti-capitalism, you know, trying to destroy people's herds and stuff like that. He's not just cutting the demons a deal. Yeah, I'll let you do this. But he's using the Sea of Galilee as a basin of water. And when the pigs rush in, what do they do? They upset the water and people see the demons have left the person. It was just a first century indicator that the exorcism had been effective. That's looking at Jesus within his historical context. So then this whole thing about Mark 5, um, is that a totally one-off situation? Is that completely weird? It's, It's a standalone. There's nothing like that out there that it ever happened. The answer is no. Even in our Bible where it's, this is the only time that ever happens. Jesus just doesn't go around drowning pigs for any reason. Okay? But this is not totally unknown or weird. People had a context. They had a background. They had the, the rest of the story against which to see and compare what's going on with Jesus. Now, what did Jesus do that was going on with Eliezer? What did, what did Jesus not do? There's no ring, there's no mention of Solomon, there's no uh, formula, there's no drawing the demon out through the nose and stuff like that. Jesus doesn't have to use modalities or methods or certain kinds of interventions. What manner of man is this? He cast out demons with a, help me out here, word, exact. That now, you know, it's becoming clear we're sort of tuning the thing in and the voice on the radio or the voice on the TV screen back when it wasn't all digital and stuff like that and you had to do the rabbit ears and you had to do the tuning device. Remember this? And then all of a sudden, bam, the picture became clear. I thought my dad was like magic when he could do that stuff. He's down on his knees playing around and messing with the rabbit ears and stuff. But that's, it's becoming clear here, you guys. What's going on and why it was that people were amazed. Why that people were in awe of Jesus. It wasn't because Jesus revealed that there were demonic presences in the world. It wasn't because they saw that people were demon possessed. It wasn't even because they saw people that had demons cast out of them. They experienced deliverance from the demons. It was how Jesus was doing this with a word rather than with all of these incantations and rituals and modalities. Why is that? Because with authority and power, he commands them. Do you get it? Are you getting that now? All right, so on Testament of Solomon and stuff like that, I can give these guys the, the um, PowerPoint presentation and you can read this yourself, but there is an ancient text. By the way, this is not in Catholic Bibles. This is a text from the first century BC that didn't make it into anybody's Bible ever, not even in April 8th, 1546. So uh, this is stuff called pseudepigraphical material and you don't even need to write that down. It's just more stuff out there from the pre-Christian period of Jews in the land of Israel. So uh, when I, Solomon, heard this, a little ring, an engraved uh, uh, stone on that ring, and I can, with it I can lock up all the demons. And if, if I throw the ring at the chest of the demon, and call on King Solomon, then he will be uh, removed. That sort of thing. 
Again, we get this liver and the gall of the fish, the intestines of the fish. We got that from the third century BC. So third century BC, first century BC, first century AD, all of this stuff is connected together in some weird, wonderful way that gives us context. The rabbis get in on this Take the roots of herbs we hear from the early rabbis, burn them under the demon-possessed person, summon him with water. Where have we heard that before? Mark 5, yes. We heard that about, uh, 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 from uh, uh, Eliezer in the story that Josephus tells us in the first century, this use of a basin of water or whatever, and the spirit will flee. Uh, here's that passage I was talking about um, I, I will bear down on this for just a second. This uh, miracle ra- working rabbi, his name was Shimon ben Yochai. He was from Galilee and he was in Rome and he cast the demon out of the emperor, the Roman emperor's daughter. And when he does so, he says, come out. And the, the Hebrew there, I've given it to you. It's the same thing that Jesus does. Come out of her. But the cool thing is Jesus doesn't name the name of Solomon. He doesn't do any kind of incantation or whatever. When we cast demons out today, and we do because we have to, it's not fun, it's not exciting, it's dirty, hard work. But when we cast demons out of people, I will not say anything to that demon except in the name of Jesus, because that's what the New Testament has people in the book of Acts doing, in Jesus' name, come out of him or her. It's all that demon needs to know. Doesn't need to know how smart you are, how many Bible verses you've got memorized and stuff like that. It's the name of Jesus. Yes. Not the name of Solomon. And not the name of David. In Jesus' name, tseh. Come out. Try the Hebrew next time. Couldn't hurt. I'm sure that demon knows it. In the name of Jesus, come out. Come out of her. And... The demon came out and left the emperor's daughter. So, again, we're back to this. It's all about context. That's what we do on the videos. That's what we do in the articles. That's what I do when I preach and teach. It's all about location, 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 but actually context, context, context.